Greetings, folkers. It's Haley, and welcome back to another chess meetup recap. And boy, the games today had a different flavor than usual. So, what I did going into this week was I kind of settled in my head on, like, going in, I would play openings that I'm familiar with and try to get into positions that I'm very familiar with and so that I could just work on my tactics instead of working on trying to, like, memorize all these variations of openings because, you know, I do enough studying of openings and sometimes I leave my tactics out to dry. Um, but as you will see from these first pair of games here, this first pair of games here, um, Gary, my opponent, I played him last week, um, he doesn't really let me go down any opening, like, at all. Like, he's one of those people who doesn't play any theoretical openings, and it, it's just, it just becomes, like, just a normal game of chess after, like, five moves, or even less. So, without further ado, let's hop into this and see how I managed against a person who doesn't play opening theory. So, I start out with e4, because... My opening with e4, the, the opening that I'm most familiar with with white pieces is e4, e5, knight e3, knight c6. This is what I call the default moves in chess. Then bishop b5. This is the Ray Lopez opening, or the Spanish game. And it is my favorite opening to play in e4, e5 systems besides the Vienna. And it is the one that I'm most familiar with. And the idea is to put pressure on this knight, because this knight is the only one guarding the pawn. There's like a gazillion variations that I'm not going to go into because it wasn't even played in this game, but it's just, it's very interesting opening. But Gary already takes us out uh, on to a weird variation with b6, which is a normal move. It's the, the Peart's defense, and normally the Peart's defense would go something like this, kind of like... It's kind of like the king's Indian defense, um, but with white's first move being e4. The only difference between this and the king's Indian defense is that white played one e4 instead of one b4. It's the only difference. But he soon showed me that he wasn't going to actually play the Peart's defense. Instead, he was going to play some weird opening because he played pawn to e6, which is known as the small center defense. And this is just a very weird opening because you block in both of your bishops and you don't occupy like much of the center at all. And you're just letting me develop my pieces. So I just bring my knight out. He plays bishop d7, knight f3, bishop. Like he's just playing like, there are a couple openings in chess uh, that are known where you can just play like a setup every single time. Like sometimes people with uh, people with the black pieces will play. It's gonna take me a while to do this. We'll play something. I believe it goes like this. We'll play something called the hippo, and this is like a super duper solid setup with black that leaves you with no weaknesses or anything. This is the hippo. The, and it's actually very, um, it's actually very powerful. Like it's very hard to crack, but laying your bishops here is not good because that's where your knights normally want to go and your bishops normally want to develop out here if you're going to play the hippo. But instead, you've you kind of left your knights to have to go out here and maybe face the pawns at some point, which is like, but you're not really thinking too far ahead. You're just like, all right, I'm going to develop super passively because I don't want to go into openings that Haley is familiar with. So bishop e2. Um, you, know, the com you see the computer suggesting different moves for me here, but like, it's really kind of minuscule, the difference. Like, I'm just basically developing my pieces here. He plays a6 and b5. Um, and it and it kind of it kind of looks scary because he's going after my knight, but I can play like a billion different moves. I could play a3 stopping this, which is what I play in the game. I could play e5 opening up the center. And if a move like pawn to b4 were to happen, then I could just play knight to e4. And this pawn is super duper weak. 
and I have big occupation of the center. He can't kick me out because of on passant, and I'm just much better. But anyway, I play a3, you know? Um, I feel like I can waste a move because he hasn't developed many of his pieces. His knights are still sitting on his home squares. h6, like... Uh, I can't help but think like I can't help but feel like I'm being disrespected when I'm put, when I'm playing against stuff like this. But I have to realize that some people don't uh, do as much opening study as I do, and this is just kind of what they think is necessary. But h6 is just not necessary at all because nothing was ever going to come to the g5 square because you already have a battery defending it. Like these. Moves are just, like, basically pass-back moves. But I don't know why you'd play pass-back moves in this situation, because I can just play e5. Like, I've developed my minor pieces, I'm ready to castle, and I just can open up the center, because I'm ready to open up the center. And if takes, takes, I can play moves like bishop h5, queen f3, and try to line up on this weak f7 pawn, which is weak because you f haven't, like, you know, made any effort to develop your king side and castle, you know? Uh, so yeah, e5, and he plays d5, which, you know, locks the middle down, which does facilitate a possible king side attack. Like, when you attack in chess, I'm not saying it's possible now, just many moves down the line, but when you attack in chess, um, you normally want the center to be closed so you can attack on the wing and the opponent can't transfer pieces over to the defense. That's kind of like a general chess principle. And if I ever wanted to attack on the wing, he basically just helped me because he locked the center up. All right. Knight to d2. My, my goal here is to play f4, f5 and attack on the wing because I'm like, look, he closed up the center. Let's go. Like, I just, I don't waste any time at all. B4. Takes, takes. And by the way, like, I'm not at all afraid, because I play knight b3 in this position, I'm not at all afraid of this. Like, you may be like, well, Haley, these double pawns suck, but when the knight comes out to c6, where exactly is it going? Like, it, it, where exactly is this knight going? It can't go to any of these squares. Like, you have to measure these weaknesses situationally. Like, doubled pawns are bad sometimes, but they're not really bad in this case. Because they're actually serving a purpose of making the knight's life miserable. So, knight b3, bishop c6. This is kind of questionable as well, because you get in the way of your, uh, your c-pawn. I castle, and I'm possibly ready to play f4. Bishop to e7. And instead of f4, I play knight a5. And the goal of knight a5 is to take the bishop and then take this pawn because I deflected the knight off of it, right? That just wins me a pawn. And he sees that and he backs up to d7, which is a great move. Bishop to f3. Now, my goal here, because you notice how there's this diagonal, right? The only way that's getting between this bishop taking the rook is the pawn. So my goal is to play knight back to e2 and c4 and put pressure on that pawn. Bishop d5, knight back to d2, and folks, in this position I was supposed to play this. I was supposed to sacrifice my knight for the two pawns, play queen f3, and again, what did I say? Going after the weak f7 pawn? Because you have not castled or developed your king side. But I didn't really want to play that aggressively. So instead of so instead of that, I wanted to do this uh the c4 line, just try to put pressure on the pawn because it's pinned to the bishop. And he tries to stop that by playing bishop b5, but that doesn't stop it at all because you still can't take with this and it is guarded by my knight. So this, this square is not actually defended two times. It's only defended once by black. So he backs up to c6 and then I take, take and play knight c3. I'm putting an extra attacker on this square. Takes, takes. This I was very happy to see because look what it has done. It has lined my rook up with the f7 pawn on a half open file, which is yet another boon to my position. Knight to b4. Um, I'm not sure what he was trying to do with this move, um, but it doesn't really matter what he's trying to do because in this position, there's a simple way to win a piece. Queen a4 check. That just wins a piece on the spot because it is a check, 
and it hits the knight. And if the knight goes back, I can still take it with another check. C6 and takes. Yeah, the computer's like, Haley, you should take this because the knight still can't go anywhere. Oh, and by the way, let me just bring, speaking of the knight can't go anywhere, let me just bring your attention to like a few moves back when he played bishop to e7. Just check this out, right? Check this position out. This knight can't go here, here, or here, so it's completely frozen. This knight can't go here or here, and if it goes here, it's going to get taken, and I will win a pawn. Like, look at how much restriction I am putting on his pieces just because he didn't develop them timely enough. But anyway, knight c3, boom, boom. Knight b4, two, boom, 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 right? Rook b8, queen a3, and then I just take a pawn. And this is beginning to spell disaster for him. So he plays queen b6, and I'm like, go ahead, trade. I still want to have control over this file. I don't care if you take me. He backs up. I go bishop h5, just double targeting this pawn. And if g6 were to be played, then I would back the bishop up and then plant a rook on f6 and double up like this. And it would just be dominant control of the op half open file. But knight f5, and I get a little fancy in this position. I play bishop takes f7, sacrificing a bishop to line the king and knight up and then playing g4 and winning back of the knight with this pin because I can afford to lose a pawn like that to trade pieces because I'm already up material. King to g6 takes, takes, and queen d3. I do this. Um, what I think eluded me in the game was the fact that I could do this, attacking the queen, and that this pawn was pinned to the king. But anyway, queen d3, rook f8, and then I play knight e2. This is the last piece of the puzzle because I'm rerouting the knight to get this check. This knight wasn't doing anything over here, so I reroute it to its new purpose here. King h7 and then knight e6. This is a fork of queen and rook. I just pick off another exchange, and then I take the pawn on f5, lining up a discovery against this king, and it's very, very hard to avoid losing your queen for black. He plays queen to b8, blundering this with an attack on the queen and a check. But apparently, the move that he had to play was rook d2. Attacking the queen, and if I take, then he would take. That's what he had to do. But he doesn't. He loses the queen, and then after takes, I play rook a7, and he resigns. He resigns because I he would go back, I would go here, threatening mate. And the only thing he could do to delay that is rook b1, which I would take. Then he could only like do that. That is like the only legal move, almost. And then that would be me. And that is the first game I played against Gary. Now, we move into the second game, which is a little bit more chaotic, if I do say so myself. So he told me that I could be white again, which is fine, right? E4, let me turn the review on. I was just kind of in my head, like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you want to play me again? Like, you know, I mean, not to be rude or anything, but like he pulls up to this game and he plays H5. Like he plays pawn to H5. And the computer says in this, but I just want to call your attention to this. H5 is a bad move that doesn't develop a piece or try to control the center in any way. That's what the coach thinks of this. <laughs> And I can't help but agree. D4, E6. He's, he's, the, he's trying to act like he didn't just play H5. Knight F3. And he might, like, I expected him to just go all out in this position and try to play like G5 and G4. But actually, that's just um, hanging. So he probably wouldn't do that. He goes C5. And in this position, I should have gone D5. I should have gone here. Because if takes, then this. And I'm actually threatening to play d6. Like, let's say he does nothing. Let's say he plays a6. I'm threatening to play d6 and check on e2. And then just, he has to block, and I will take the whatever piece blocks with the pawn, and that's just very deadly. But instead, I play bishop to b5. This was kind of a moment of just like, what the hell are you doing, Haley? Because I'm like, all right, I'm pinning this pawn to the king, but there's just a6. And I have to move back. 
I, I don't understand at all. And then he plays H4. Like, he's just like, well, I played H5, so I might as well start attacking on this side of the board. And this is a theme that is going to be present in two of the games that I played this week. A theme that is present in these games is that a pawn attack, like a flank pawn attack like this, is only as dangerous as the actual practical implications that it can cause. Just the fact that a pawn is advancing down towards my position in and of itself isn't that scary. And I managed to realize that in this position because I could just go out my business. I could go about my business, sorry. I could play there. And I could play here and queen d2, which, by the way, was a mistake because uh, he could play bishop takes g5, knight takes g5, and then he could he could take because I can't take back because I would lose guard of this, which is why instead I should have played I should have just taken. But after queen d2, he plays h3, and I don't even take. Because if I take, I, I don't like the fact that the, the pawns are doubled and that he might take with the rook and the g-file is open. So I'm just like, you just gave me a pawn, bro. <laughs> F6, bishop to e3, I back up and guard the pawn. He takes and I play rook to g1. Where is the attack? Where is the attack by black? This You can't even take this, and this pawn is just a sitting duck to the rook. Like, where is the attack? Just the the, just the, re, the way that you launch a pawn like this uh, doesn't mean that it is powerful at all or that it's beneficial to your position. It just takes time playing chess to be able to evaluate that nothing bad can happen from a pawn push like that because to a beginner, it does seem scary. So knight c6 takes. I just take the pawn back, and then he trades queens and loses another pawn. Like, uh, it's never really a good idea to trade queens when you're down any form of material. I mean, I know he was only down a pawn, but like, not only was he down a pawn, but his position was much worse as well. And it's not good to trade queens, especially because I can just take another pawn. King of Fate, Rook back to g3, and then he plays knight back to c6 because he doesn't like that his knight is on the side of the board. It was a good move by him. Knight a3. I play knight a3 because I'm looking to play knight c4 and then use my pawn, right, to anchor my knight into his position. And maybe play like c3 or a3 and then b4 and just make it like super powerful and unable to be taken. He plays d6. I take, I take. And then I don't play knight c4 right away because of this, but I didn't not play knight c4 because of this, because I, for some reason, didn't see this in the game, and I played castles! That was a blind spot. I'll admit that was a blind spot. I'm still even material, and my position is still better, but that was really bad. And the reason my position is better, by the way, is because his king is still in the center of the board. He has terrible dark squared weaknesses. He hasn't developed this bishop, this knight, or these rooks. That's why his position is worse. Knight g to e7. I play knight c4. And then I plop my knight on b6, so just attacking these two pieces. He moves, and then I go there. The computer in this position wanted me to play knight h4. Why? I'm not exactly sure. I guess it just wants me to eye this square, and it wants me to block, right, block the rook from coming on in. Knight d7, takes takes, and my idea was like, I'm infiltrating with the rook. This must be good. But there's really no tangible targets for me to, to hit. So King e8, I back up. And this is a bad move. And the reason it's a bad, he finds why it's a bad move, by the way. He punishes me perfectly for it. I should have played rook to d1 because this stops his idea. After rook d6, he can force the rook trade with rook to h1 check. Because if I go here, then he's going to play rook d8 and pin my rook to the king. And if I play this, then he's going to play rook to d8. And if this, then then I get then I get mated, right? He's forcing the rook trade. King to d2 takes takes knight h4 in this position i play knight h4 because i want to cut i want to try to like cut the amount of squares that this rook can move to he plays knight b4 kind of just eyeing these two pawns 
but it's not really that scary. I attack the rook, the rook moves. I move the pawn from being attacked by the rook, and I hit the knight. So the knight goes back, and I play king c3. I play king c3 because I just want to, like, keep an eye on all of these pawns. I want to just, like, put my king on b3, and that's kind of where it will live for the endgame. Knight e5, bishop b2, and I'm ready to boot that knight back out with f4. Like, this is one of those instances. I know it's the best move, but... It's one of those instances where, like, you play a move, you hit a piece, and then it backs up, and now your knight is a target, right? That's just, like, a common thing. Like, you move to attack a piece, and then when the piece moves, that piece that attacked the piece can become a target. Knight 7 to c6. And then I play a 4, and then he plays this because he was probably like, okay, if she takes, I will take. And it's good for me but he missed one key move in this position, and that is king to d2. And I am just waiting, because now his knight is under attack, and his rook is under attack, and he can't save both. He can't, like, give me a check or give me a check without losing one of his pieces. So he plays rook to b1, I take, he takes, and then b4 to avoid this. And I was really unsure why he didn't play rook a3 in this position i like he could have just gone after my pawn but i guess he didn't like how this pawn could have just gone up the board which is kind of what happens but rook b2 and i start pushing the pawn he plays there takes takes i don't mind exchanging i go up and i, I hit this pawn rook b1 g5 there there and i take this is just like an extremely uncomfortable position for him because I have a rook. I mean, I'm sorry, a knight and bishop for a rook, and I'm up two pawns. And also, this is a pretty powerful pass. King e7. I attack this, and then in this position, I play king e3. Like, I'm not really sure why I played that. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, why didn't I just take? Yeah, he plays this. Knight f5. And then king f3. I'm trying to like I'm trying to go after this rook, but he takes on c2. And I play knight d6 check. This allows him to step here and just hit the pawn. And there's very little that I can do to defend it. So I try to trade pawns by going bishop to c8, targeting a6. There. King to g4. He checks me. He checks me incorrectly. He should have just taken the pawn and gone down this trade, and then played rook to c6, attacking both of these pieces. That's what he should have done. There, there, takes, defending the pawn from taking, but, and as you will see in this position, by the way, the computer is evaluating this as winning. And you will see how it's not winning for a person of my level soon. It's, I know that may sound weird, but you'll see. Bishop e6, he attacks my pawn because he didn't want to go here and lose his rook. King f5, takes, takes, excuse me, king g6, knight f7. Now, the computer suggests that this is the best move, and after a5, it's not good. But for the life of me, I can't tell the difference in between this and, like, the other position, because it looks like this bishop is still going to stop the pawn. Like, I'm not really sure why it's so much better for black in this position, but apparently, like, the computer must see something. Like, in all my looking at this game and analyzing it, prepping for this video, I didn't realize why that was so bad for me. But rook b2, it's, he's trying to, like, wrap around and maybe pressure my king from the backside. Rook b2, king e7. This is a good move because I hide my king from all checks. I protect my pieces. This bishop is still looking over here, and I'm just, like, kind of cocooning. Rook d4, boom. In this position, I'm like, all right, here. Because you might be like, well, Haley, that pawn is free. But I did that because after this, there's a fork. And by the way, he didn't have to take. He could have gone king to g7. And this pawn is still under attack. And then I would have had to play like bishop f5. And, you know, we just play on. But there, and he loses his rook. And now the computer evaluates this as winning for a computer, but not someone of my level because I would have to perform the bishop and knight checkmate. And I've done it a couple times in practice, but never in a game. 
never in a game have I been able to pull off it because it's really hard. Knight of three, blah, 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 right? And then we go here. I go there. And then I do this. And I accept a draw. Because, hey, I'm not fighting for any rating points, and I don't want to embarrass myself by not bishop and I checkmating. But the com this the, this is what the computer wanted. Right? After a bit of shuffling like this, I'm just get this one. Blah, 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 blah. The computer wanted the mate to proceed as follows. King c4, king b6, king b4, king a6, king c5, king a5, knight d8, king a6, bishop b5, check, king a7, king c6, king b8, bishop a6, king a7, king b5, king b8, king b6, king a8, bishop b7, check, king b8, and knight c6, check. I mean, if I played this, you'd have to, like, you'd have to probably check my pockets to make sure I didn't have a cheating device in there. Like, I swear to God, like, that's... That's ridiculous for someone on my level. But anyway, that game was a draw. And now we move on to my second opponent and last opponent of the day. Max, who I played two games as black against. And this third game here was extremely short. And you will see why. So e4, e c6. This is the Karakon defense. This is the first opening I ever learned in all of chess. Just very solid c6, d5, Karakon defense. d4, d5, knight c3. This is the classical variation, and normally it goes something along the lines of this. Bishop g6, knight f3. You know, I, I think I've showed this a couple times before, but this is like a very theoretically analyzed position. People know a lot about it, but I play what the great Anatoly Karpov did back in his day, knight to d7, with the intention of playing knight g to f6 and taking with the knight instead of the pawn. But there is a trap in this position that Max could have set. I wouldn't have fa fallen for it, but he could have set it. He could have played queen to e2. And you may be like, well, Haley, how does that stop this? Well, it stops it because knight d6 is double, or not double check and mate, but it's just checkmate because this pawn is pinned. That pawn is pinned and the king can't go anywhere, and it's just basically smothered mate. But I didn't fall for that. And by the way, uh, if he had played queen e2, the best move is knight d to f6 because takes, ta or, um, takes and takes, because this would be protected by the queen. But knight f3, knight g6 takes takes. This is mainline Karpov variation. Bishop to g5. I play bishop to g4, and in this position I was eyeing h3. I thought I had this, this, and then check hitting this and this, but the bishop can go back. And after seeing that, I analyzed, well, don't I have queen to b6 in this position, but then there's just bishop to c3 protecting both pawns. And I eventually saw that in the game, and I was like, all right, I'm not going to go for that. I'm just going to take queen e2 check, and then block with the bishop, and just be solid. Now he castles queenside. And I think I've said this before, but when sides castle opposite sides in chess, it is a declaration of war. Because both sides are going to attack with pawns and pieces on the side that their opponent's king has castled. Queen to e4, and I take. I'm really not sure why I did this, because now I allowed him to open up his rook, but you will see that that doesn't really become a factor, because this game will actually end very quickly. After rook to e8, lining up an attack against the queen, I played bishop to d3, and I can't, of course, get hasty with bishop d6 in this position, attacking the queen, because he did set up a battery, and that would be pretty embarrassing. So I played g6, just kind of blunting it. h4... Queen to a5. You know, I should have just attacked the queen in this position. Because after a move like queen a5, um, he could play like bishop to c4 and defend it. And be fine. Because he still has a pretty strong attack going here with rooks and pawn and queen. But this kind of does show an important point in opposite side castling attacks is that 
you don't always have to just throw your pawns at the enemy king. You can actually use your pieces to attack and create threats against your opponent's castled king. And the, he actually let me just take his a two pawn. And by the way, folks, remember when I talked about um, that pawn advance by Gary not really being scary? Well, this is the... <laughs> that rhymed. Um, this is the other example of that from these games, that Max is just pushing this pawn, trying to attack on the king side, and... I just see that, like, if he takes, I'm just going to take back with this pawn, and nothing is hanging, and I still have a threat against the queen, I still have a threat on this side of the board, like, I just objectively evaluated that this pawn attack wouldn't achieve anything, even if he did make it all the way and take my pawn, and then he played queen f4. He played queen f4 probably to i h6, and maybe play, like, pawn to h6, and, like, if I move the bishop, he would take and lolly checkmate me. Um, by the way, the lolly mate is when the pawn is here and the queen is here. Um, right. Queen a1 check. This is what he blundered. Queen a1 check. And there are two moves. The move I played in the game is queen takes b2. But the best move is bishop to b4, which leads to mate after c3. Queen takes b2. Bishop c2. Queen c3. King to c1, bishop a3, king b1, queen b2, checkmate. But after king to d2, I take on b2, and then he takes. And do I take back? Do I even take back in this position? No, because I have checkmate in one. Because notice how this hits this. This pawn is pinned by the queen, and this rook controls this entire file. That is just game over. And that, folks, is another story of how you should always evaluate these pawn advances objectively and realize that some of them just don't work and that you can do and put things and pose your own threats. All right. So now let's get into the last game of this week. Um, I play against Max again, and this game is definitely not as short and vicious. This game is way more, you know, end gamey, right? So E4... E5. I'm not even sure if that's a word. End game. E4, E5. Knight F3, Knight C6. You know, since I played two games as black against this guy, I didn't want to play C6 again. I wanted to kind of vary it up a little bit. Um, and in this position, uh, he originally played the move Knight to G5. He originally played the move Knight to G5. Um, which, A, is just a free knight. And B doesn't even threaten anything because this bishop isn't out on C4 double attacking the pawn. So I, I just don't really understand why he would play that move in this position. But I let him take it back. And then he played D4, which is the scotch game. The scotch game is uh, E4, E5, knight of three, knight C6, D4. And the idea is that after takes, you take with the knight. And if black takes, then you activate the queen. And there's no pieces of blacks that can go after it. So instead of taking the knight, black's main move is to play knight f6. And then after knight c3, the best move is bishop to g4, putting pressure on this and threatening to take this. And then it goes down lines like that. But after bishop g5, I play bishop to c5. And by the way, this is a pretty uh, common trap in the scotch is that white will sometimes play bishop to e3. And then black will just play the innocent looking developing move bishop c5. And that actually loses a piece after knight to c6, hitting the queen, hitting the bishop, which is unguarded, and white just wins a piece. But that's not the case here because there's no bishop on e3. But anyway, after bishop g5, bishop c5 takes, takes. I take with the b pawn because I don't want to trade queens in this position. Knight to c3, d6. And in this position, he allowed me a take back because originally I played the bishop takes f2. <laughs> Because I thought that after this, I would get this, attacking this, and attacking this. But then there is just queen takes, because this pawn does not attack that square. But, folks, even if, even if that pawn, even if the bishop protected that square, it still wouldn't work, because just queen takes knight. And if this, then this. If this, then this, then this. And even though his king's on f2, he's up two piece points of material, and it's an endgame. And so that doesn't matter as much. But he plays e5, which is just a strange move. Is d takes e5, 
queen takes d8. So the point of, of this was to sacrifice a pawn temporarily to get a queen trade. King takes check. He long castles with check, which is a gangster move, by the way. And the best move is bishop to d6. Just getting in the way of the file. And most importantly, protecting the bishop with a pawn, which... I will show you how that would have been a massive boon to my position in the future, because the problem with blocking with this bishop is that now after bishop takes knight, my king has to stay glued to this bishop forever, and I'm just stuck in the middle of the board. So this is just really uncomfortable. The computer still thinks that I'm better because I'm up a pawn, I have the half open G file, and I can just play bishop to d6 at any point and cut anything that he has along this file. But I didn't see that in the game. I was just like, wow, I hate my position. It sucks. He plays knight e4, simultaneously attacking the bishop, defending this, and going after this, which is just very nice. So I play bishop d7, just getting out of the way of all three of those things. Bishop c4, f5. The, like, I'm still better, but I need to find the move bishop d6. Like, this move just solves all of my problems. I get out of this. Bishop Pawn protected the bishop. Um, my king is free to move around. I can bring the rooks wherever I want. These pawns are all protected because there is no more pin on this Bishop, so the knight can't take this pawn. Like, all of my problems are just solved. Knight to g3, but I play king to e7. <clears throat> because I defend this because I unleash the... the I um, stop the pin, right? And I was afraid in this position that he would play bishop takes f7, sacrificing the bishop to invade with the rook. But for, some, for whatever reason, he didn't play that. He played this. Alan, I, I thought I was kind of getting out of the weeds with f6 because this is no longer, you know, a take of a pawn, right? Then he just does this. He does that. Here, here. And I think after the game, he told me that, like, he did this because he would keep my king in the center and then, like, do this and then take here, and he would just have a lot of pressure. But my king was already stuck in the center of the board. Like, he didn't need to throw in that rook sacrifice. It was just, like, not not very sound. Rook takes d7. I just take, I just, this is kind of one of those moments where, like, my opponent did a sacrifice, and then I just kind of, like, looked at the board for a second, just, like, making sure my eyes worked properly, that he actually played that move. And I was like, what? Like, I don't understand. And then I, I just, like, I very slowly picked up my king and I took the rook and I was like, look, I'm going to call your bluff. I don't think you have anything here. Rook to d1 check, king e8. But this was my last chance, folks. This was my last chance to play bishop d6 and just get in the way. This was my last chance. I think in this position I didn't play it because I was worried about knight f5, but... I said pawn protecting bishop. That is the absolute key. And then I can just launch a pawn attack over here, or I can go and attack down this pile. Check king e8, and now I just lose this pawn. And now I can't really play bishop to d6, because, like, the knight can get in with check. Rook to d8. This is a pretty big blunder because of this. And you're like, well, Haley, you can just move and attack the knight, but then... 96 check forking the rook and the king and after king to e8 the best move is not even to take this he takes it in the game which is fine but the best move is knight takes c7 forcing king back to f8 and then forking the rook you just like take an extra pawn to go in a doggy bag you know <laughs> but yeah knight takes d8 bishop takes bishop e6 king e7 and then he backs up in this game, folks, I'm sorry to say, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. I attack the pawn, he just defends it, and then I played rook to g7 because I'm like, well, I'm keeping my rook on this file and defending my pawn, but there's just rook to g7. And I think at this point I was very fatigued because I was just tired. It was kind of a long day for me, and uh, I was just very um, kind of out of it at this point, and I just completely hung rook d7 because I didn't realize that 
uh, I think from a distance, I was like, well, I can just go king e8 and guard my bishop, but that just loses the rook. And I realized that after I played rook d7, after he played rook d7, and I was just like, oh boy, I'm losing, aren't I? He goes after the pawn. I don't know actually why he didn't go here and just force the rooks off the board. I think that would have been a quicker way to win. But anyway, rook c8 takes, takes. He takes, and then I go king to f8. He takes, takes, takes. And no matter how many pawns I can mop up, I find this creative way of getting here because check, the king has to go here. And then this. But no matter how many pawns I mop up or no matter where my rook is, I'm just ultimately going to be defeated. Because rook to six, king to f4, a7. And no matter what I do, he will check me and make a queen. So I resign in this position because if I play a move like this, he'll just check me and promote. And it's over. And I didn't feel like playing on. But anyway, that's the end of the games. That's the end of the games, but I have something else to, to show you real quick. Um, so next to me, my uncle actually came to this one, this meetup, and next to me, he was playing a game. And he was playing a game that featured the Vienna opening which of course is e4, e5, knight c3. This is the Vienna, and in this position, his opponent played knight f6, and he played f3, which, by the way, takes it from being a Vienna into what is called the king's pawn opening, king's head opening. I, I'm really not sure why it's called that, because, because a pawn to f3 after e4 is called the king's head opening, and it's very bad because you open up this diagonal for nothing in return. Whereas the best move is f4, because although you open up this diagonal, you create a very tangible threat on black. You, This is threatened, right? And if black takes, then you push up to e5, you stop this, 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 and this, so the knight has to go back to g8. And you may be like, well, Haley, can't they just pin the pawn? Queen e2. Same dilemma, knight has to go back, and then you play knight f3, stopping queen h4, and then your next move is going to be d4, and then you take the pawn back, and you just have a very, very nice position. Um, but in the king's head opening, uh, you, you don't have that same, uh, you don't have that same pressure on black. But also, also, um, I wanted to show you one last thing. E from C6, D4, D5. Um, wait. No, this was something else. Uh, where did I... Did I play knight C3? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So in this position, knight F3, knight F6. So they had a position that's similar to this in the game. Let's just say that something like this happened. And black played the, black played the move queen E7. This was... My uncle was white. Um, this wasn't the exact position, but it was something similar to this. My uncle was white, and it was his move, and queen e7 had just been played. The best move in this position is to castle, by the way, because after queen takes on d4, the best move is not rook e1. It is not rook e1, because bishop to c5, and this knight is still being protected by the queen. The best move is d4. Queen e7, then rook e1, and then you're going to play f3. That's the best move. But my uncle in this position, I don't I don't remember what he played, but the threat is if he just goes back to f3, it was different in the game because um, it was actually a checkmate threat in the game. Like, this bishop was on b3 or something. So, actually, better to better demonstrate it. Let's have him slide the bishop back, then take, and then queen e7. My, in this position, my uncle, I don't know what he played, but if he just goes back to, to f1, then knight to c3. Or knight to g3. Either one of these is good because it is a check, right, with the queen. And if you block, it's just mate. That's that's mate. In the game, it was a double check in mate where, like, the king had no squares and the knight upon moving actually checked the king. 
But this kind of demonstrates the same idea. I just wanted to show you those two things from that game. Uh, yeah, and that, that does it for this week, folks. Uh, I've been the Amazing Haley, and I will see you in the next video.